Hey, pals, just want to say thanks to our listeners who are supporting independent podcasters just like Go With The Heat. You make this show possible by hanging out with us each and every week, and we love you for it. If you'd like to show some additional support, please head over to your podcast platform of choice and give us a review. And I'm going to say, give us a five-star review. You do what you want. I'm just going to ask for a five-star review. Now let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season three, episode 21, titled Knock Knock, Who's There? I don't like this I title. I think we're going backwards on name titles now. <laughs> yeah. like, this is going back. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't even make sense to the actual episode. It's getting lazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It originally premiered on March 27th, 1987. Surprise, it's written by Dick Wolf. You should just stop saying that because we already know all of them are in <laughs> It's directed wait by... for you to go like... This one is written by Michael Mann. <laughs> when did he come back? It is directed by Tony Warmby. He doesn't have anything else to vice credit. He directed some random TV episodes here and there. So it's okay. We can be a little hard on this one, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't come back. We don't have to talk about him again. <laughs> I think we're going to be in agreement on this one, that this is another one of those middle of the road vice episodes, just getting ready for the end of season three. I think we are. I have a long stare happening to me to the left. <laughs> you may be right. <laughs> I think you may be right. <laughs> Before we get started, to check in so it's going to each other's lives. The guys, you know, we mentioned Don Johnson. He's got a new movie with Vince Vaughn, kind of a smaller movie, but we failed to mention that the biggest movie of the w- ball not the winter, because Star Wars is coming, people. Let's not get out of hand here. But the biggest movie of the <laughs> fall was Coco. And Coco has Edward James almost in it. Castillo makes an appearance in a Pixar movie. Yes, he does. And I'm sure he was as intense in an animated <laughs> film as because I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> as he is, he's just frustrated, furrowing his brow, thinking about all the skeletons he's got to deal with in, in hell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a skinny tie. He doesn't wear skinny ties anymore. <laughs> he said this is his like his biggest moment as an actor was being in this one scene in Coco. He's on in the entire thing. He's nope. just in it for one scene. He says no. this is his b- biggest moment in acting. Yeah, he had a pretty compelling no. argument as to why. <laughs> I don't know. In an animated, if I don't, nothing Pixar does is the best moment of an actor's career. <laughs> they do for money afterwards. <laughs> Except for the people that did Frozen. They made a whole career out of that. (laughs) (laughs) Or is that not Pixar? That's just Disney, huh? And Frozen even snuck into Coco. Frozen snuck into Coco, too. There's a 21-minute, essentially, TV spot. No one's happy about that, though. Coco plays. So one of the reasons why I'm not seeing it in the theater. We'll wait till it comes to home theater and skip that. (laughs) Yep. Yes. Yeah. I I support Edward James Elmos in uh, most of the stuff he does. I am a big fan of the Battlestar Galactica reboot, which, if I had to argue, would be Edward James Elmos is probably pinnacle as an actor. Just (laughs) saying. Um, We don't have enough time to argue that. (laughs) I mean, he was in a was little movie so called good. American Me. bought Me. the UK version <laughs> Blu-ray on eBay. <laughs> Just saying. He was in a little movie called American Me. <laughs> I would hope that was a more memorable kind performance. Kind of sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go talk about this episode. And surprise... We have a dirty cop. Welcome to season three of Miami Vice. Let's go talk about this episode. (laughs) All right. So we open up. And of course, it's a vice. We're open up at a bust outside of a strip club. What else would be going well, it's on? It's actually on a inside Friday the night? strip club, isn't it? Well, yeah, but I'm seeing like the camera rolls and we're on the outside of the strip club. Uh, there's a bunch of police set up all over the place inside. The duo are making a deal with Frank Sinatra. I mean, Esteban Montoya is who they're He's doing. He's the wise Montoya. <laughs> and, you know, when I heard the name and I was thinking like, but this is the foul mouth prostitute pimp. <laughs> In Deadwood, not Esteban Montoya. Yeah, not right. <laughs> you are correct. It is Ian McShane who plays Al Swearinger in Deadwood. He played him from 2004 to 2006. Um, he's an English actor and voice artist. Just on a side note, he plays Esteban Montoya in this episode. 
But we will see him again playing General Manuel Bourbon in the wow. episode Freefall. So <laughs> oh, <yes>. Wow. <laughs> I remember that episode now. Oh, you guys are going to love that one. It may be, not going to so tell Estevan you for sure, be, it may be made up in a made up land. A, <laughs> it, yes. And this time he's a general. <laughs> <laughs> so he's known mostly for his roles he also starred in a show called Lovejoy from 86 to 94 that was kind of his big break or, or like his pinnacle time as an actor and then he's been in a bunch of stuff as far as voice acting and, and just appearances I mean he was Tay Lung in Kung Fu Panda he was Blackbeard in Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides currently plays Mr. Wednesday on the Stars series, American Gods. He was Captain Hook in Shrek the Third. Even has another Vice connection, not just from being in the episode, but he appeared as a guest MC on Grace Jones, who is in our music for this very episode, on her 1985 album, Slave to the Rhythm. Wow. Uh, he kind of pops in as like a narrator in between songs. <laughs> Weird. So, Weird. Yeah, as, remember now, this episode is from 1987. So two years prior to this, he was on Grace Jones' album. And you know, he looks, I'm, I'm joking about he looks like Frank Sinatra, but he really looks like Bobby Darren in The Godfather. Oh, yeah, he does. <laughs> he does, yeah. Uh -huh. That's a better connection. <laughs> so the duo are inside trying to do a deal. They are testing the Coke, but it's not testing that positive. So they're doing this back and forth game of, is it worth as much money? How much money are you going to get up front? And then the DEA, just locked and loaded, come busting into the club, which is Club 78. And they take everyone and they handcuff them. Even the duo, the duo are looking shocked when the DEA come busting in. But then after a few moments, you're watching like, this is kind of weird for a DEA bust. This kind of feels like a holdup. Mm -hmm. And the DEA said, okay, the, yeah. re the regular date cops are on their way and then they run off. They take the money and the drugs and they leave. Mm -hmm. And the duo's like, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first, I just want to uh, mention that when they're talking about how weak the Coke is, Tubbs throws out that fantastic line, I've peeled paint with better stuff than this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that gets included. They, they came busted in. At first, I was like, why don't they coordinate ever coordinate with the feds on this stuff? Because they clearly look surprised. And then, like like you said, after a few minutes, uh, after a few seconds, I was like, wait a minute. Are they getting robbed? Like, is this like a <laughs> fake DEA raid? <laughs> it threw me off that at the end of this, the DEA are like, okay, the, the regular cops are on the way. Let's get out of here. They'll take it from here. And the duo were still afterwards like, I don't know, it feels kind of fishy. Let's ask the DEA and see what they say. They're like, no, nah, we got to yeah. check. So, <laughs> yeah. So, like, in the next scene, they're, they're talking with Castillo. And they're, they're saying, like, I can't believe the DEA ruined it. And it's like, we go into the episode with Vice Crew still believing, like, the DEA actually raided them. Yeah, even after Castillo bails him out of jail. I know, right? I wonder how long you let him stay there. Like, uh, <laughs> they need to learn their lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I had to put my pants on. I'm still wearing my Speedo. <laughs> and they say in that conversation, they've been working him for months. They're setting up like this 60 kilo deal to be able to take him down, which as we find out at the end of this episode, like all the rest of this stuff would have never have happened if this bus would have went down because Esteban's big time as we find out at the end of the episode. And so they would have taken care of this real fast. But and I have my doubts. I have this sneaking suspicion that Esteban knows that they were cops. I don't know. He acts pretty surprised. And that's why <laughs> he kind of like he has set this up too. That's part of the reason why he set this up. I kind of get a little shaky about it at the end too, because it's like when we get towards the end episode, it's like, well, someone's got to know. They're getting out of jail and they hit over the precinct there. Castillo was saying, we have to run this through the DEA. They're probably not going to help us with it, and they're not going to talk about it. That's just their MO. That's how they operate. And he tells the duo, get a sketch artist to sketch out all the DEA agents that you saw. And so that's the best that we can do here. So dad actually being on point here, he understands how the feds are going to work. He knows what's the best thing for them to do to keep their investigation going. Meanwhile, at the DEA, the DEA's Castillo is the same, the exact same thing. Like, don't talk to nobody. We're in a gag. We got to <laughs> find out what this bust was that happened at Club 78. And one of the agents says, well, we didn't do a bust last night. Case solved. He's like, that's exactly what I'm talking about, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> you moron. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do one last night. And the vice team are saying that we did. But he's also very clear to say, yeah, I, I don't want to be embarrassed by the local yokels. 
So we got to figure this out before it, before it gets any bigger. Yeah, I, I love it. So Vice called them and was like, hey, did you guys do a bust? And their answer was immediately, uh, no comment. As, you know, and they're like, like which means no they did didn't a do bust, one. So. <laughs> yeah, well, don't say anything to Vice. They think we did a bust. Let's just let them think we did a bust. <laughs> you know, like they're so trying to cover their butts. Um, also, lead DEA agent, his name is Sam Art Williams. He was an actor, nothing really big time. What really caught my eye with him was he guest starred in an episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. But he also wrote nine episodes and produced 19 others. Wow. For the Fresh Prince. He also produced Martin and Hanging with Mr. Cooper. I love those shows. <laughs> All those shows. <laughs> yes. If, you know, we're in this reboot era. I would have no problems with them rebooting and Hanging with Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Where are they going to find Mr. Cooper? <laughs> Let's get a new oh, Mr. New? Cooper. Oh, new? Okay. I was yeah, like, uh, yeah, I don't think Mr. Cooper's Mr. around Cooper. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> also, what, whatever that show was with LL Cool J, where he was the former Raider. Where he was like a Raider and a nanny. Uh-huh. I love that show. <laughs> oh, what was it? In the house? Or... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the house or something like that. Yeah. I love that show. <laughs> something like, yeah, I love that show too. <laughs> This meeting ends really strangely, too, because the DA lieutenant is announcing, like, hey, we're in our gag order. We got to do an investigation. There's something dirty happening within our team. And then there's this lady sitting at the table. She's like, oh, God, I hope he doesn't call on me. Oh, God, I'm nervous. Yeah, she, like, freaks out and spills crap all over herself, (laughs) draws attention to herself. (laughs) She's the last one there. And then the lieutenant comes over and talks to her and is like, hey, how's Brian doing? Is he doing okay? And how's Chuck? Is Chuck all right? She's like, he's fine. I'm fine. I'm out of (laughs) here. Leave me alone. She's clearly under a lot of stress. All the telltale warning signs if you just got out of a meeting saying, we need to do an internal investigation. No one acts suspicious for the next six weeks in front of Vice while we do this. <laughs> Her. <laughs> my son is dying. My husband's in a wheelchair. <laughs> I just spilled coffee on my lap. I got to go. <laughs> yeah, as soon as she started talking about medical bills, I was like, oh, she's so selling them out. <laughs> and it's even like the boss knows too he's like maybe you shouldn't come to work anymore we don't really need yeah. you around just take some time off we'll figure it out <laughs> back at the county jail Castillo was interrogating Esteban because he got picked up in the club 78 because he was still handcuffed when the Miami-Dade police showed up so the duo are watching Wait, Castillo's so talking to him a, I, I want to bring this to kind of dawned on me when Tubbs and Crockett were inside the club doing the deal with Esteban. They had no backup with them. No one was in a parked car outside, like in the van. Yeah, you know, I didn't think about that. That's really weird. Like, not, not even Switek in the van with a bug. Well, Zwitek was probably asleep. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing his magic. Uh, <laughs> like, I lost all my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I think the better question is, why do they keep, like, keep letting him do surveillance on things? As we find out later, there's a <laughs> yeah. problem with Switek doing surveillance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I, I realized episode showed surveillance is not their best forte, but... Or still, recognizing like, people in a crowd. It's surprising to me that, yeah, <laughs> that no one was backing them up for this deal that was going down. I mean, they, they should have been there instantly. Yeah, because the deal, this was a deal, like the actual deal was going down. Sorry, the, the pre-deal, and then they was going to do the big one afterwards. But. Also, why do they? Why does Castillo act like he doesn't know anything about it? When they get him out of, when he gets him out of jail, they, he's like, they're telling him, he's like, oh, okay, that's cool. Like, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. Is so, that what you guys were doing this exactly week? All that, where'd you get all that money from? Like, they had to get money from him. $200,000. So, but no one, yeah. no one got like permission where they had it in this briefcase or what? <laughs> well, at this interrogation scene, they got nothing really on Esteban and his lawyer is threatening a lawsuit. So Castillo comes out and tells the deal, like, we got to cut him loose. And the DEA still hasn't gotten back to me. And I got a call into Washington. And so now the duo are finally getting suspicious. Like, hey, there's something weird happening over at the DEA. And then a cop pops in, looks around the corner and says, Hey, which one of you is Tubbs? IA wants to talk to you. And Crockett, you're next. If you must be Crockett and you're next. <laughs> At this point, we... everyone thinks suspicious. The DA is suspicious. Vice is suspicious. IAB is suspicious. Everybody's suspicious. <laughs> I love this IA agent, too. Melissa, you had mentioned this in the last episode we had where there was deep investigations into Crockett from IA. Yeah. That they're always going to be a dirty cop. 
Uh, no, because they're little rats. <laughs> what you know, is past? Who, who about, works you know, on the rat squad? Uh, that would be it. the IA people. They are on the rat squad. That's what that is. <laughs> Anyways. There yeah, wasn't they, some they, controversy with a bunch of money and a boat and pirates, <laughs> you know, in Crockett's past. They didn't even do it. They didn't even have anything to do with that one. <laughs> they didn't have to talk to anybody for that. Yeah, no, they're they're always after him. And they and I love the way that Crockett always overreacts, though. He's always like right away, like, ah, oh, you jerks. <laughs> Get, Suck the, eggs. No, out. my favorite line ever. <laughs> Suck, Suck eggs. eggs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but this IA guy is like seriously depressed with life. He's not, he's so unhappy. He cannot because he can't bust Crockett. He knows he'll never actually get him. <laughs> also, he does not have as good as hair as Crockett. He's got what he's like a balding mullet, <laughs> not the feathered oh, mullet. Oh yeah, Crockett. Crockett has. Uh, I mean, that feathering is ridiculous. <laughs> I know someone had to go in there with a big brush and like blow it out and style it that way. <laughs> I haven't seen that type of feathering since a Pomeranian. <laughs> <laughs> now, Stro, the IA cop, is really out to get him. And you're right, Melissa, Crockett just flips out immediately. But they're just doing their jobs. How come everyone's always so hard on IA? Like, it's kind of fishy. That all this money and drugs and no DEA bus no, is happening not, here. No, he's not just doing his job. He's being a jerk about the whole thing doing your job is asking questions not going like you guys have always been crooked and i'm gonna get you but but he makes a fantastic oh, point to... here at the end where he says hey if it wasn't for that boat and those fancy cars and the clothes you're just a regular thirty thousand dollar a year flat foot just like us which is all true because sunny lives this lie oh that's true but uh first of all he's never gonna be like sunny so take a look in the mirror, dude. Melissa. <laughs> no. Melissa, you have to admit, looks suspicious. Oh, Talking yeah. This, I'm not saying it doesn't look suspicious. Doing a deal without backup. <laughs> doing a deal without backup with money that we can't verify if they should have even had. And then magic D rate and all of the drugs and money are gone. And they're pretending like, you know, like it, they didn't oh, take no, it. I get so, that I it's mean, suspicious. But what I'm saying is I'm never going to side with IA. So <laughs> I've seen enough NYPD blue. I know what they did to Bobby Simone. I'll never forgive them. <laughs> Not happening. So we go to now another deal that's happening. Fake DEA team is watching again. It's actually a pretty big deal, too. It's like a couple of kilos it, it, of a briefcase it's a, of cash. It, it's a drug deal montage. Uh, because you <laughs> so got the mullets. music going, they're handing out coke, everyone's happy, and then the <laughs> robbery comes in just as the baseline kicks in, you know? And Colby, our DA agent, is listening to people get murdered on the radio remotely, and so now we're introduced as the audience. Oh, Colby is the one that's dirty. Oh, we didn't know that already, Surprise. though. Surprise. <laughs> Shocks. Yeah. And she's very sad about that one person getting shot. <laughs> by the way, DEA agent Linda Colby's also played by Elizabeth Ashley. She did a bunch of TV stuff like Mission Impossible and The Love Boat. She was on four seasons of Evening Shade, which is kind of like the longest stretch of acting that she did. But she also made appearances on Law & Order you and homicide life on the street i read a little bit about her bio she's done like a little bit of everything sprinkle it around <laughs> <laughs> later at these docks where this bad deal had gone down with a da fake dea robs them a couple people get shot during the process later the real pd are cleaning up the duo shows up and crockett and Tubbs talks to one guy, James Balcala. They don't really get anything out of him. It's kind of a waste of time. It's you get to see it his is attitude. a waste of time. Homicide's <laughs> taken over, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question though. How are the police just showing up? Are they calling the police? Are the DEA agents calling the police and being like, hey, something's going down over here. Just go pick these people up. I'm really confused as to how that's working. I think they are. I think they're actually calling the Miami Dade police. Now, in this case, some people got shot. But still, someone has to call the police, and the criminals ain't calling them. Yeah. <laughs> so these people are tied up. They're not calling yeah. anybody. Yeah, I think they're actually calling the police. That's gotcha. part of their deal, which is weird. Which is weird that the police just show up with a van. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really confused right now. At a different place on the docks, Colby is meeting with her muscle. Now, these are all the people who dress like the fake DEA agents. And she just wants to see their boss. She is not she happy with how this deal went. to be an old-timey gangster? I don't know what's going on with that. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Did you notice that, like, with her voice? Like, like you screwed up, see? <laughs> I mean, the, uh, the boss man, see? I want to meet him tonight, see? 
I thought it was really weird the way that they she she shows up to that boat and they all like pop out like hey you know, <laughs> with their guns like who wants to know like all like shoulder to shoulder it's very weird <laughs> yeah and she just wants to talk to their boss she's like hey I don't like how this went down you guys are getting sloppy we need to get back to proper. <laughs> also the boat's called big al that they're on i noticed that right away <laughs> like, called big al back at the precinct you're talking to castillo no news from the dea but obviously there's something very wrong castillo says they might be doing their own investigation which is why there's a gag order so that's all this is at the hospital colby shows up and she's talking to a doctor and he wants to put brian her eight-year-old son on the donor list now this doctor has an interesting approach like we want to save your son we're going to do it we're going to get him on the list he can get a new kidney by the way your insurance is probably going to cancel on you this is going to be crazy expensive he's going to be on the list for a long time think you can handle that yeah i don't understand (laughs) i'm gonna try and talk you out of it i'm really confused (laughs) as to what she's supposed to do i mean i understand like you're not supposed to steal your money from work let's get uh, not do that part okay but when when the doctor tells her that what is she supposed to say also, later on in the episode when their husband's like, can't go into Hawk for that. Like, what are you supposed to do? It's your kid. <laughs> I don't understand what you're supposed to say. I like, know. Nah, don't give it to him. <laughs> I didn't understand that angle about the episodes. It, it is like between the doctors and her husband. Yeah, they kept saying like, we can't afford to save our kid's life. Give it up. And die. Also, no <laughs> one's ever at the hospital pay. with this freaking kid. <laughs> She's so well, worried about her kid. the hospital's not wheelchair accessible. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i told Dominic. i'm like so this guy can't go to the hospital and be with his kids just wheeling around his house like doing nothing <laughs> maybe his house is a wheelchair access when he's stuck inside <laughs> he can make She's tea him stairs <laughs> <laughs> he can make his own damn coffee and tea he can't go see his kid <laughs> Lazy. don't even get me started on the tea it's the tea's <laughs> fault we're in this <laughs> Colby does go up and see Brian. Brian asks if she's scared because she looks scared. And then we head back out to the docks that night. Colby is talking to Esteban. That's hmm. the boss of her muscle. <laughs> and they show up in separate boats, in which now you put together, like, oh, okay, and the first fake or the first fake DEA and the robbery was set up by Esteban. So he was in on this from the beginning, which is why me and John are talking about. We think he might know that they're police. If he watches the news, he knows. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure everyone in Miami knows. And so I was just thinking, like, so he robs himself. Like, okay, but why? He got the vice money. Yeah. He did. 250000 yeah. or whatever. Which makes this whole next part very confusing. <laughs> why well, do it again? Colby says, Esteban asked Colby, I thought you were out. And Colby says, I was, but now my doctor told me I'm basically going to get shut down on the kidney transplant because my insurance is going to cancel and I don't have any money. So I'm ready to do this again. And he gives her an advance and then says he'll be in contact and leaves. And he's creepy about it. <laughs> also, he's the best dressed boater that we've ever seen. He's wearing like a tuxedo wearing that stupid boat. <laughs> if, the, if everyone else is wearing suits, Melissa, you got to step your game he's up. He's like on a dinghy, though. He's not even on a yacht. He's like a regular boat. He's just cruising around in a tuxedo. You gotta dress up more if you're, you gotta dress up more if it's just a dinghy. <laughs> dress up the damn Make dinghy. Up for it. <laughs> at the same time, the duo are at Colby's house and they're talking to her husband, who has been shot. That's why he's in a wheelchair. He's a former agent as well. And they're over there talking and having a good time. And Colby shows up and they let loose, like, oh, hey, there's this investigation happening. Colby's like, yeah, I'm not even supposed to talk to you guys right now. Ha, 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 ha. And then Chuck, the dad, or the hu- the husband, is like, hey, wait a minute. Did you guys come not to talk to me, not to hang out with me, but to because you're investigating a case? We haven't talked in two years, and I got shot on the job. And you guys didn't come? You guys know how to leave. Get out. It hurts. You know, words hurt, too. Not just my back injury. Yes. Words to be fair, when we come in, he's in a conversation telling them about how he's half a man. He's so. pretty, uh, open about how he's half a man. And if you see the pain on your partner's face and how basically how she's a uh, saint because she puts up with him and then their kid's sick, which, by the way, he's still I'm saying he doesn't seem that broken up about his kid being sick. <laughs> he's yeah. still worried about himself. So, by, by the way, way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, by the way, Chang played. By Jimmy Ray Weeks, so Seattle native. You might know him from movies The The Abyss. He was in Requ- Requiem for a Dream. Analyze this, The Siege, Dead Man. He also played Major Whitaker on Major Dad. I will always um, remember him from his performance in the episode One Eye Checks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, when Susie came in, it's like, I've seen this man before. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I want to touch on something that, that you said that they hadn't seen him in two years, which made me wonder, like, is he another former partner of Sonny? Like, is that why that he's is that why he got shot? <laughs> no, he's is a that DEA why he agent, hasn't seen so. him in two years? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how to handle this. Normally, my former partners die and you're still alive. So I don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Awkward. Also, Sunny does not deny that they're just there for information. No. He could have said like, no, I just like, you know, I just thought of you. No, he just sits there like, yep, that was me. I did it. <laughs> I don't really like you. Sorry. I never liked you. <laughs> the next day, the entire vice team is meeting and they're going over all the evidence that they have. Nothing. They got nothing. And the DEA is still refusing to cooperate. Crockett says, well, hey. Maybe it's not the entire DEA and all 30 agents that are involved in this. Maybe it's just one. Wow. <laughs> and he's got a gold badge. <laughs> and Castillo's like, that's cool, but it still means it's a DEA problem. <laughs> and they'll want to run their own investigation. So <laughs> I, well, I've talked about this already. How many times do I have to say it? <laughs> you almost feel like Castillo just wants to stand up and goes, I just want people to leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> Back at Colby's, Colby is spo- spoiling Chuck with some gifts, gives him some stuff for his back and for his seat. She also says that Brian is up for the transplant. He's going to be on the list. And this is when most of you were saying, he's like, how are we going to afford this? Uh, yeah, I don't understand like a, what the alternative is. It's like a vet decision. He's like, well, <laughs> he's like how did we get on the just list? Saying Spike isn't doing so well. And he's kind of old. <laughs> I mean, we can get a new one. Do we have a mortgage to pay? <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean, just bought a new car. <laughs> I really don't know what she's what they're supposed back. to do. Like what they're supposed to do at this point. I get that he's like, "Where's this money coming from?" Or where? But what, what were they going to say if they didn't have the money? Like, nah, never mind. Let him die. <laughs> I think the key thing here is that he's saying, yeah, pretty much, the jackpots can't he afford kids. He, he won't take. <laughs> That's what he's money. saying. They can't afford to have kids. <laughs> they should have known that going into the beginning. They should have never had him to begin with. Well. They can't afford them, so eight years later, gonna have to just <laughs> cut, cut off the kid. <laughs> Crockett did it. He did it a different way. Crockett did it. The key here is that he's talking about that he wouldn't steal money from these slime balls that they deal with. That that's that's dirty money. That that's not the way that he wants to do it. He doesn't care about his kid. Let's just get that right out there. Okay. All he cares about is himself and his sheepskins or whatever the hell he's got on his back. <laughs> <laughs> so now the duo have an idea on how they're going to get back to Esteban. And this involves Izzy. Now, Izzy, <laughs> Izzy, man, how much stuff are you mixed up in? And is he hired for this? Because they head over to an art house and Izzy's in the middle of doing like a performance art where they're standing. Moving art. Yeah. And then they move. And then Izzy. No, goes, that's his art. That, for that's the record, his art. That's his okay. art. Okay. They, they say something about him being an mm-hmm. artiste. <laughs> is he's moving up in the world how much you know what it is important now i want i want to see is he be successful how much longer is he on probation <laughs> exactly well i mean i think he still exactly. does if he's not supposed to so probably <laughs> can i just say though it, it was a perfectly timed is he seen because i really needed an is he seen at that point <laughs> but also that leotard leaves nothing to the imagination <laughs> Just saying. It's going around in a circle right in front of me. <laughs> and it's not pretty. <laughs> so uh, uh, essentially, Sonny's plan is for Izzy to spread the word that Burnett is holding. My first thought was, well, Esteban's already robbed Burnett, so why would he <laughs> rob him again? I know, I know. Why would no. <laughs> We know you're not holding because he got robbed. So after they go to see Izzy's art and then tell him that we want to get the word out on the street that we have that that we're holding so you know let all your drug buddies know that they can if anyone's looking to buy a whole lot of cocaine we got it and apparently is he just like go- gets on the horn and just blares it out there and i'm <laughs> oh, sorry we have money yeah we have money to buy a whole lot of cocaine yeah let the street know. <laughs> so then the duo head over to the diner and Colby shows up to talk to them. This conversation doesn't really go anywhere. We have a handful of conversations now between here and the end of the episode where Colby is talking to Crockett and the, and she's trying to say no one in the DEA would be dirty. And Crockett's like, no, it's pretty obvious. Someone is. I need your help. So It's even better because she, she specifically says that the DEA thinks that it'll just go away on its own. <laughs> oh, like yeah. <laughs> the person who's going around robbing drug dealers, pretending to be the DEA, will eventually get tired and just go away. <laughs> They'll wear themselves out. They'll need a good night's sleep. 
But my, I do. Look, this look, is, we're going to have and then we'll be back to normal. <laughs> Don't now, investigate it, honey. That's what we're trying to say. <laughs> now, this is my favorite scene from this episode, though. Tubbs is in the background, like eating his root beer floats, kind of minding his own business. And he wants to all raising his eyebrows when he's like, oh, okay. Like, uh. What is he, like five with his root beer floats? <laughs> Every That's time he comes out. Thinking, like, does Crockett buy him, have to buy him a root beer float to keep him quiet? <laughs> You know, yeah, he's like, I'll like, only go with you if we get you. a float. <laughs> the other thing is, is that this is the meat fondler diner where the in, the other investigator yes, comes in and delivers is. the letter where he's Lieutenant, like, I don't like yeah. you, poopy heads. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like you. I don't want to work with you. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't even realize that that was the meat fondler diner. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. That's what we call it now. <laughs> At the docks, Colby is waiting for Esteban, who looks like a vampire in this one. Yeah, the tuxedo starting to get a little much. <laughs> <laughs> he's talking to Colby, and she's like, the heat's too hot. And he's like, well, I don't want to deal drugs right now anyway. What I kind of want is I want information on this Sonny Burnett guy. Word on the street is, is that he's got cash. I want you to pull his file. And after a while, she's like, all right. She says, I can't pull his file. Like, she starts all getting right. all panicky. <laughs> Yes, he does, because he's wearing a cloak. That's why it looks like a vampire. <laughs> she kind of argues with him a little bit, but, I mean, she kind of goes along with it, too. Ultimately, she's like, I don't know. Like, okay, fine. You yeah, know? she does not but fight that hard. what bugs me is like, okay, so maybe Esteban doesn't know that Burnett is an undercover cop. Clearly, at this point, Colby should know that Sonny <laughs> Burnett is Sonny Crockett, because she was just eating lunch with him a minute ago. I don't ago, know. I was just thinking about that. she was maybe at she the first robbery in the car. <laughs> nah, she's gotta so, know at um, this point, right? That that's who that is. She's gotta know. She's gotta know. Yeah, so she's selling so out again, another cop. Why try and rob the vice cops twice? <laughs> you're playing with fire here, right? You're you're torpedoing an investigation, selling out your badge, and trying to hit the same rube that works for the vice team twice. <laughs> Maybe she's really mad because they never came and saw her husband. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe. Okay. All right. <laughs> see, <laughs> see, but see, this, I think she could have gotten away with it, but they got greedy and they tried to rob Crockett twice because they figured <laughs> Burnett, you know, he's an idiot and everyone knows him as a rube. <laughs> How come Tubbs is not involved in this? How come it's just Burnett? Like, is he just like the guy that goes along with him or what? The word on the it, street is, is that he's not really a Jamaican <laughs> businessman. <laughs> <laughs> lie he is too jamaican but he certainly likes root beer floats and veggie burgers <laughs> at the precinct later they're looking through a b- b- bunch of bug shots and stro from ia comes in and he's there saying that he want he's going to recommend full suspension without pay during the investigation he just slithers in like a little snake <laughs> and dad's amazingly skinny tie i mean it's skinnier than normal i think it's on a diet i think the tight is actually on a diet <laughs> remember i'm like dad's behind you he's by he's listening to you I'm, i think it's down to a rope i think the problem here is that they, they refuse to buy him a new one and it's just wearing out <laughs> and it's so small <laughs> i love that part he comes in he stands behind him and then he excuse me lieutenant and he could still just sits there and stares at him no i'm not moving i'm not getting out of your way that stare was basically his way of saying, like, come on, buddy, let's throw hands. You know? <laughs> Don't talk to my sons that way. <laughs> Later at the precinct, the la- the ladies come in and they have information that on one of the fake D agents that Castillo had them do one of the sketches on. Surprise, surprise. They have all the information the that ladies, you need. The ladies get their work done. You can count on them. <laughs> Real police work. They found a guy. His name is Porfi Avila. He's a Colombian national who happens to work. For Esteban Montoya. Surprise! Esteban is behind these DEA raids, and so now they know how to get him cornered. Then we have an, another one of these diner scenes where Sunny's talking to Colby. She's saying, I don't know, this sounds kind of fishy. I think it'll all just go away. And he's like, they're in official DEA uniforms. It involves Montoya. And she's still like, oh, I don't, you think? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> she's a terrible actress at this point. <laughs> 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 At Colby's, when she comes home, Chuck found a large roll of money and wants answers. He had to drink his tea. <laughs> he wanted. Co- he decided to have tea instead of coffee today, but he never went to see his son. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think little see, Brian would like some tea sometimes is- too. <laughs> but little Brian can't eat any no, food. It just proves <laughs> tea is a terrible choice. <laughs> yeah, I know. Always go with coffee. Tea is a terrible choice. <laughs> 
and this is what we knew was going to come eventually. Chuck was going to find out that she's t- stealing money from people at work. Well, she's not stealing. She's working with them and setting up police officers to get them murdered. But she tries to be like, no, nah, baby, like, I love you. Yeah, I love you and I love Brian. Before I answer, I want you to think of our sick son who you haven't seen in weeks. <laughs> Neither has she. It's been days since she went and saw that kid. <laughs> well, someone please think of Brian and this whole thing. <laughs> Later that night at Club 78, Colby's talking to Esteban. She gives him the info and she's begging now, like, please don't kill this police officer. He's a good cop. Do not kill Sonny Crockett. And he's like, hey, what's a better cover than someone's already being investigated by IA thinking that he's the dirty one that did all this. Let's just let him take the fall. We'll kill him and let him take the fall because he can't defend himself if he's dead. I mean, he's got a good point, though. So let- <laughs> he does. And let's be clear. Now, everybody knows that Sonny Burnett is Sonny Crockett, the cop. Everyone in Miami at point should know. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't know Tubbs is not Jamaican. How? <laughs> <laughs> so then Colby has a quick stop off at the hospital to see Brian. For once. Because, you know, bad stuff's about to happen. So she has to go say goodbye to her son. Now, I did miss that at that Club 78 scene, Esteban then sets up the deal. It's going to happen the next night at Cali Ocho. They're going to go meet behind the bleachers. That's where you do drug deals. <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's great. You get this, like, Esteban calls the station to see what Sonny's doing, you know, and he's kind of <laughs> like, hi, what you doing? You know, and they have this, they flirt for a little bit, and then they do, uh, you know, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. So, Sonny and know. Esteban have such a beautiful relationship. <laughs> so now over at Cali Ocho, it's an outdoor festival. They do over there, the other. Vice members are spread out throughout the festival. Switek trying to pick people out in the crowd. Not one of his strengths. <laughs> He's also poor doing Wells w- Where's Waldo books. Like, <laughs> He's like, I don't know. I can't tell where anything is. There's too many people. They might be wearing a wig or something. I don't know. But in the end, he is the one that, so, p- that picks him out of the crowd. It's true. It's true. It was quite a quite a scene change to go from that somber goodbye to her son scene and then merengue everyone's <laughs> dancing <laughs> so, and of course like the vice squad in plain clothes obviously talking in the giant walkie talkies <laughs> they don't have like ear buds or something they can wear or i don't know people are supposed to meet up with esteban esteban shows up with his two bodyguards he's obviously going to go kill Sonny Crockett, and then I guess by proxy, Rico Tubbs. Before that could happen, Colby comes running up through the crowd. Gina yells into the into the walkie-talkie. walkie-talkies. There's the DEA is there. Colby just comes running out and says, freeze, Esteban. Shootout starts. Colby shoots and kills or shoots one of the bodyguards. Esteban takes a hostage. They shoot Colby. And then a big shootout starts that involves the vice team. Luckily... No bystanders are hit. Well, they don't show any, but yeah. So, I am slightly confused by this. Did either Crockett or Tubbs have a briefcase with them? No. So no one had any money. <laughs> they won't give them any money. They're still under investigation. They can't get no money. <laughs> so Esteban decided instead of robbing the vice team for the second time that they were just going to murder a cop for no reason. Yeah, he was going to murder him. That's what was going to happen. He said, I'm going to slit his throat. But before he gonna was going to rob him. But he decided instead of robbing him, that he's just going to murder him. Yeah, he's just going to yeah. murder him. Because money he's a cop. <laughs> Sorry, Esteban has a really hard time loading his gun throughout this scene, too. He constantly gets it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> also, he's wearing a leather tuxedo jacket. <laughs> his loading his gun problem gave Crockett plenty of time to practice his rolls. <laughs> yeah, because Sonny tucks and rolls, shoots in, or he shoots a bodyguard, and then he gives chase to. Esteban, who goes on this very pink hallway. Like Pepto Bismol pink. Oh my God. <laughs> and then after. No, it, like it was a, so pink, it actually made Crockett look pink. Yeah, everyone was pink <laughs> down it. Yeah. And then after a few minutes, Esteban's like, okay, you got me. Yeah, that was really weird. <laughs> he's like, don't shoot, don't don't make me shoot you. And he's like, Meh. okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Burnett with the win. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't shoot himself in front of him either. That's a that is a win. That one right there. So when this is all said and done, they got Esteban. They killed the bodyguards. They busted the man that they wanted, and they also found out which the DEA agent is dirty. 
Because she kind of just put herself out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, She finally decides to do the right thing hey, at the very last minute. She could have done it any sooner. Everything would be okay. She wouldn't go to wait, jail. Hey, when Linda first got shot, I thought she was dead. So, like, we come to this scene and she's laying on the gurney. I'm like, oh, good. She's not dead. She's just going to be arrested. <laughs> like, like, okay, thank you. <laughs> and Esteban gets arrested. So the main bad guy and the crooked cop are both alive. No one died. Well, I mean, unlike, except for the bodyguards. But <laughs> yeah, unlike the dirty cop uh, uh, episode we had just a couple of weeks ago in red tape, where all of them died, including some innocent police officers. Yeah, don't talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Linda does make a good point at the very end of the episode. She, Sunny. That if he had a kid, he would have done the same thing. But we and know, I said no. He we'll, we'll never know because he doesn't have a kid. So <laughs> that's what I said to Dominic. When we were watching. He didn't even know where his kid is. So no, he wouldn't do that for his kid. Somewhere in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> so that is with a dramatic uh, reading of her rights. Yeah, and no freeze frame, just a fade out on reading her her rights. Sonny looks upset because he knows why she was doing it. It's the wrong, doing the wrong things for the right reasons. He doesn't look, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> also, like, he didn't have to be the one that did that. He could have left that to someone else. Like, but no, he had to read her her rights. <laughs> and that's the well, end of the episode. At least he could do after seeing him for two years. <laughs> I don't like that guy. I wouldn't see him for two years either. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll take it though, because it's a dirty cop episode where they didn't, not everyone got murdered. There's actually going to be justice brought to a lot of these people. Who knows what's going to happen with Esteban? But they at least, you know, were able to serve justice and find the dirty cop. I hope, based on how many dirty cop episodes we had in season three, I hope we're done with dirty cop episodes in this episode in this season. There's only three to go. How do you feel about dirty cops yeah. who, think, who have amnesia? <laughs> <laughs> and I say that with like swirly hands. Amnesia. <laughs> I'm just saying, hopefully this is it for season three. Oh, yeah. I think you're you're safe on season yeah. three. Can we, can we at least the four. next season without another dirty fed? <laughs> well, let's go talk about this week's music because it is massive. I say that with a capital M. Massive. There is so much music in this episode. <laughs> let's go talk about this episode's music. All right, John, we got some merengue, we got some new people, we got some old people. This is a big music segment. What do you got for us this week? All right, so we have some reoccurring, we have some we'll meet later, we have some that, well, just not a lot of info on, and then we have a fantastic Indian genius. So let's get started here. We'll start with Dire Straits right across the river. We covered them pretty extensively back in the music for Brother of Arms. Money for Nothing was their big hit if you didn't if you didn't catch the music from that episode. Something that you might not have known about that was that Sting from the police co-wrote the song and also appeared as a uh, backing vocals. So mm. we'll, we're going to just gr- move right along. We're going to go to Santiago by Fernando I- Villona. That sounds right. He's a Dominican merengue singer. We actually have seen him before. He was in season, in this season, episode 11's music for Forgive Us Our Debts. I knew that. I didn't forget about that. I recognize (laughs) that name. (laughs) If you want to hear more about him, go back and check out our episode 11 show from season three uh, just a few weeks ago. We're going to move right along and we're going to get to La Cina by... Belkis Concepcion y sus chicas. Sean, that was I have no idea if I got it right. I, 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 I'm going to call it you got it right and actually a standing clap. Yep, for, <laughs> that was a hard for, one. <laughs> for that name because they set you up big time on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Belkis is a hard one to find info for. She's mainly known because she was the founding member of all female Dominican merengue band called Las Chicas del Can. Now, Wikipedia and certain other biographies, Wikipedia says that, that she was with the band from their inception in 82, but another bio I read said that she actually put the band, uh, started the band in 1976 as the lead singer pianist. And now, they make a pretty pretty big statement in the next one. They also said that it was the first 
all female merengue group in Dominican history. And I don't know. I mean, in all of history. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a pretty <laughs> profound statement. That's one of those statements. Was like, yes. me wrong. So, <laughs> so she would start the band in 1976, and about and actually the band was originally called Las Chicas. But about five years later, Wilfredo Vargas would become the producer, and he would add Del Con right around about a year into their him producing them, Belkis would get sick and he would actually replace her with a 14 year old named Miriam Cruz. At first she would just fill in, but by 1984 she would completely replace Belkis. Belkis would try and go solo and from 85 to 90 she would release five albums and see middling success, but no real chart toppers. Her only real song that would chart during that time would be El Hombre Que Yo Amo, uh, which would make it to number seven on, I, I guess, the merengue charts in February of 1990. <laughs> um, I can't really find anything on her since 1990. You would not believe how many Belkis Concepcion's are on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Our next song is The Water Boys by Shriekback. And Shriekback will be reappearing in a future episode called Baseballs of Death. <laughs> Which just sounds like a Best fantastic episode. I can't wait for that one. <laughs> They're an English rock band. They released five albums from 81 to 89 with, and I'm quoting here, with li little to no success. So, but we will so, we'll talk more about them. So and they're the related to Michael Mann. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that Michael Mann the uh, must have been a fan of them because he also used some of their music on his Manhunter soundtrack. That brings us to the song The Fashion Show by Grace Jones. Grace Jones is a Jamaican singer, actress, supermodel, record producer. Her and her family moved to Syracuse, New York when she was 13, and she would start modeling in New York, and she would just be big time after that. In 1977, she would secure a record deal with Island Records, initially becoming a star of the New York Studio 54 disco-centered scene. Early 80s, she would move kind of tor more toward New Wave, and she would collaborate frequently with a... Vice music favorite, Sly and Robbie, seeing success uh, in the 80s would also propel her acting career. She would start in some very low-budget films before making her first mainstream appearance as Zula in Conan the Barbarian in 1984. The next year, she would follow that up with 1985's James Bond flick, A View to Kill. A side note, during that time, when she was when she was starring in the James Bond movie, she was dating Swedish actor Dolph Lundgren. I, that's how I knew her, because she was dating Dolph Lundgren for like four years or something. <laughs> just every morning. She, she probably got tired of her after a while. Just every morning, every conversation. You want some eggs? If they die, they die. <laughs> I'm we, tired of the money. I'm going out with Bill today. If he dies, he dies. <laughs> he started out as her bodyguard. All right. Mm. Yeah. So now I'm going to try your mind here. Dolph Lundgren was Grace Jones' bodyguard. That's how she stood out. So let me explain to you the situation. Dolph Lundgren had just gotten a master's in chemical engineering and received a Fulbright scholarship to MIT. He moved to Boston but Grace Jones would convince him to leave school and move to New York with her. He would become her bodyguard, and she would get him a role in the James Bond flick she was in, A View to Kill. Very next role would be Rocky. Damn. Damn. Yes. About, if it wasn't the... for Grace Jones, Dolph Lundgren does not make it to Rocky. He probably isn't even an actor. He's probably some rocket scientist. Yeah. Getting all the cool rocket shit we could have got out of Dolph Lundgren yeah, he had, wasted his time being he, an actor. He had a fellowship. He was going to have a fellowship at like some crazy college, like Harvard or something like that. And he passed MIT. it all up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he passed it all up so that he could go with her to go, like she was going to go model and stuff. And then he was just gonna go ride her on the back of her motorcycle. That's what he said. <laughs> I, I watched an interview with him. You know, he still uh -huh. gets teaches at college. She would go from 85's Bond flick to 86's Vampire flick, Vamp. She would also provide music for that movie. In '92, she would do Boomerang with Eddie Murphy. She would also put music on the, that soundtrack, and that would kind of become a trend. In the '90s, she did. She would do more soundtrack work. As recent as the Hunger Games. So, mm. like, even now. 
while she's still doing soundtrack work. In 2017, she collaborated with the band Gorillaz on the song Charger for their fifth album, Humans. So she is still in the studio as well. After all of that, what what more can we have on the music? Well, we have Heat of the Night by Brian Adams, a Canadian superstar. <laughs> now listen, listen. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. <laughs> listen, there's the 80s and there's music in the 80s. And I, Melissa, I know we've been married for a long time, but I have to, I have to admit something to you. I gave my heart to Brian Adams years <laughs> before we met. <laughs> I, I love me some Brian Adams. <laughs> Which is funny because I love the 80s and I'm like, eh, Brian Adams is okay. That hurts. <laughs> <laughs> So Brian Adams began playing nightclubs at 15 years old. By the time he was 17, he was working as a backup vocalist for a Vancouver studio. In 1976, he became the lead singer of a band called Sweeney Todd. And even though, even after some mild success, he would leave after less than one year. He would spend some time in, in some cover bands. At this time, he would meet longtime friend and fellow guitarist Keith Scott. And then at 18, in 1978, he would meet Jim Valance, the former drummer and, and songwriter for the band Prism. So he had recently quit Prism. The two met a few days later, meet up at Vance's home studio, and basically be working together ever since. Brian Adams' career, all of his songs, are Jim Valance basically co-wrote all of his songs with him. They've basically been working together writing songs ever since then. And not just songs for Brian Adams. They co-wrote songs songs for other artists too they co adams co-wrote songs for bonnie rat roger daltrey as well as doing a ton of soundtrack work himself with songs like all for love which he wrote and then performed with god stewart and sting for the three musketeers soundtrack other songs that he would do for soundtracks everything i do i do it for you off of 91's waking up the neighbors would be featured on the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves soundtrack. Have You Ever Really Loved a Woman would be featured in the movie Don Juan DeMarco. And that's just to name a few. He has so many awards and he has uh, just so much successful stuff. On a side note, one of his biggest songs, Please Forgive Me, off of 93, So Far So Good. One of my favorite things is the video of that song in, in like a studio session. And there's this German Shepherd that's like right by his side. And, and during the filming video, the German Shepherd's actually the producer's dog. The dog liked Brian Adams so much, he wouldn't leave his side the whole time he was recording. And so the <laughs> dog just ends up in the video. All that aside, I pretty much ran through just about everything as far as all of his big hits. He's, he's at Summer of 69. 1984's Reckless it was pretty much his breakout album. A couple more little things that you might not know. In 1990, he voiced the evil rat henchman Hoodwink in the Canadian TV special, The Real Story of the Three Little Kittens. That sounds he very also, Canadian. <laughs> let, let's try If we can't get it... Even more Canadian, Adams also performed at Wayne Gretzky's final game in 1999 at Madison Square Garden. Above all of that, he is also an avid photographer. He has mm. been published in magazines like Vogue, Vanity Fair, DQ, Esquire, as, as well as having a ton of showings and galleries. What I'm saying here is that in we like to poke fun at Canada, right? So we like to have some fun. What I'm saying is that there's only two Canadian national heroes that they on their Mount Rushmore. There's Terry Fox, the man who ran over 3,000 miles across Canada yes. to raise money for charity. And then there's Brian Adams. That's it. That's all you need to know about Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I think Canada would put up a fight on that. But <laughs> I also learned a lot about Grace Jones, who I had to go look up while John was talking about her. <laughs> you not know who Grace Jones was? Like, really? No, I did not know. And when you mentioned her in the episode, like you saw that Grace Jones was involved, I'm like, uh, I'll have to look that one up later. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go get our final thoughts on this episode. The music is his own animal in this because I would say the music far outperforms the episode. Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go break down our final thoughts on this episode. All right, John, why don't you kick us off this week? What are your final thoughts on this episode? My final thoughts is I think you hit hit the nail on the head earlier when you were talking about just being one of those middle-of-the-road episodes. It seemed like we had middle-of-the-road guest stars. We had another Dirty Cop story. 
we had the old vice end in a gun battle. Now, to their credit, we didn't kill everybody this time. There were some survivors of the gun battle, but, you know, <laughs> it was very much in vice fashion. Starts with a sting, ends with a gun battle. Vice doesn't know what's going on through most of it. <laughs> Bad guys know too much through most of it, but still make decisions. I would say, moving forward, that, one, I really hope to, to not have to do quite as much research on the music <laughs> moving forward. we are only three episodes away from being done with that, which is going to put us almost done like right at the beginning of the next year and right around the time we all might be in similar places i'm, I'm thinking we might have have to do something special coming up end of season spectacular bonanza <laughs> <laughs> also johnny hinted on something there and uh there's gonna be more information about this coming out soon <laughs> that 2018 will be the last year for Miami Vice because you figure there's about 50 episodes left of the season or there's like 48, 48, 46 to 48 episodes left in the season. We're probably going to be wrapping up Miami Vice about this time next year. That's crazy. So stay tuned. More information about that, Palace. Melissa, <laughs> what are your final thoughts on this episode? Pretty much I echo what you guys have said. It is middle of the road. Obviously, I harped on it a lot. It really irritated me that no one cared about that kid. <laughs> <laughs> He needed a kidney, for God's sake. He needs his parents to be at the hospital with him. <laughs> He's got so, another kidney. <laughs> so at this point, I felt sad for Brian. No one cares about him. He can't eat anything. He's got to have dialysis until he gets a kidney. His mom's running around. His dad's at home shooting hoops in his wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at that bike he can never ride. It's a sad day for Brian. <laughs> I don't think he knows how to get to the hospital, what room number he's in, or anything. So I'm sad and scared for Brian. <laughs> I don't have much to add to what you guys have said, other than this would have been a fantastic episode if it was a rogue gang was pretending to be DEA and not another dirty cop episode. Like I said, I hope in the last few weeks we don't have another one because we've had so many in season three. I'm kind of past the dirty cop thing. This would have been a fantastic episode if it had been just some random gang. If it had been the Ikaios, which is what Esteban mentions earlier, where they were pretending to be the DEA and robbing gangs and it turned into gang warfare and the Vice are trying to figure out who this, what gang was being the fake DEA, that would have been much better. But instead we get, like you're saying, kind of a middle of the road Vice episode. I'm looking forward to Viking Bikers from Hell next <laughs> well, I mean, week. the title alone. Yes, <laughs> which has Benicio Del Toro. So I'm very, very looking forward to next week. And that's going to do it for us this week, pals. We hope you enjoy this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love, 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 love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com or tweet at us at Go With The Heat. Check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash Go With The Heat. Pretty much anywhere you want to look for us, you can find us slash or at or whatever. Go With The Heat. And you know what would also help us too? It's the season of giving, pals. We love you. We love that you listen to us every single week. We love that there's other people who love Miami Vice just as much as we do. Please, for Christmas, <laughs> think think of little Brian. Go <laughs> to your hospital <laughs> bed. <laughs> Go to your podcatcher choice and give us a five star review. You don't have to give us five stars. I'm just joking about that. But just please give us a review. Go to that platform and give us a review. Go to iTunes. Go to Google Music. Go to TuneIn. Wherever you happen to listen and go ahead and give us a review. Good, bad, however you want it to be. We would love for you to go leave us a review. It helps people find the show. It shows that people are listening. It would really help us out. That is going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. <laughs>